Hello and welcome back to our series on musical covers. In parts one and two, we dove into this fascinating topic, exploring how certain renditions can surpass the original in popularity, emotional impact, and creative interpretation. From super famous cases like Cash and Nine Inch Nails Hurt, to Whitney and Dolly's I Will Always Love You, to lesser known stories like Cyndi Lauper reclaiming Girls Just Wanna Have Fun for the Ladies, or the original Danish version of Torn, and now we continue our journey detailing the transformative power of music reinterpretation. <laughs> Let's start things off with the timeless classic, Twist and Shout. Initially recorded by the R&B group The Top Notes in 1961, it was a toe-tapping gem featuring a lively brass section and an infectious rhythm, but alas, I'm sure you already know what came next, the Beatles' explosive rendition in 1963 that turned the world upside down. John Lennon's boisterous, raw vocals coupled with the band near feral energy sent dance floors across the world ablaze. I'm not sure how many people in the 60s were capable of twerking, but with this track, anything is possible. The Fab Four stripped away the brass, focusing on driving guitars and pounding drums, creating a frenetic atmosphere that became an anthem of youthful exuberance. Take it off, baby. Till now, I always got by not knowing Alone by Heart was a cover. I never really cared until I heard about I-10. And now I'm even more grateful for Heart. Joking and slight disrespect aside, the 80s track was originally sung by the group I-10, formed by songwriters Billy Steinberg and Tom Kelly. And it's perfectly fine, but it's also just kinda heartless, you know? The essence of the song is there, and I don't want to seem like I'm diminishing their talent, especially since they penned a dizzying number of iconic tracks and went on to be inducted into the Songwriters Hall of Fame. It's just nearly impossible to compete with the unbridled talent and just force of nature that is Ann Wilson. Her vocals build and build with the music to this ear-shattering climax, making the ending incredibly intimate and poignant. But the song actually didn't go from I-10 to heart. Oh no, first it made a U-turn to a show called Dreams, where it was sung by a young John Stamos. Yes, you heard that right, Uncle Jesse did it first, and not very well. The show was soon canned, and Hart had been reluctantly seeking writers for a power ballad, and Kelly and Steinberg were unsure about giving them a loan, just not thinking it was good enough. Well, they were wrong, and the song immediately climbed to number one in the U.S. There were a few comments mentioning John Mayer's version of Free Fallen by Tom Petty, and for good reason. Personally, I prefer the John Mayer version, but I thought, there's no way people don't know this as a Tom Petty song. Well, maybe, maybe not, but it turns out this is the definitive cover of the song. John Mayer's version went double platinum in the UK in 2021, and gold in the UK in 2022, even though the cover came out in 2007. His version really makes you think about the lyrics and brings about that feeling of freedom, but emptiness after the disillusion of the relationship described in the lyrics. The original has more of a devil-may-care attitude, really pretty dismissive, especially as the opening sarcastically paints a cavity-inducingly sweet and sterile image of the girl, meant to make us chuckle Riley at how much she clearly is secretly evil because reasons. I don't doubt that the person in the Tom Petty version wants to get back with this girl, but I'm not really sure why. Mare's delivery seems more like the character in the lyrics is coming to this as a flawed, regretful human being 
who knows they've made mistakes and wants to show her he wants to be the person she deserves. It just feels very human, and the acoustics amplify the yearning. If it's worth anything, at the time of recording this video, the live version of John Mayer's cover has more views than the Tom Petty music video, so boomers stay mad, I guess. Bad boy, cause I don't even miss that boy. For those of you that did not know, the crown jewel of the car soundtrack, Life is a Highway by Rascal Flatts, was originally released a decade earlier by Canadian rock icon Tom Cochran. The cover really isn't too different, though a little more high energy and featuring those classic, pleasant country backup harmonies. There's also a harmonica solo present in the original that is sorely missed by Cochran himself saying, I like the way they do the song, but I miss the harmonica. And to be fair, the harmonica totally rips. Originally, Life is a Highway was written to be an uplifting anthem after a trip to West Africa to fundraise for World Vision Famine Relief. There's a lot to be said there, but we're going to move on to some 10 years later when Rascal Flatts were asked to cover it for the upcoming Pixar flick. They were skeptical both of covering a classic like Cochran and of the movie itself, saying, he told us about this movie, Cars, that he was doing. We were like, well, that sounds weird, so the cars are gonna talk, but Toy Story worked, so you know what you're doing, John. By redoing it, Rascal Flatts stapled themselves to music history and fans of animated talking cars everywhere. We received a ton of comments about Leonard Cohen and Jeff Buckley's hallelujahs on the past couple of these things, and if you want the full story, which I promise is very, very interesting, and most people don't know how crazy the details behind the making of this song really are, I made a whole video about it like four years ago, but in the meantime, Cohen's original masterpiece released in 1984 was like a poetic whisper in the night, showcasing the pessimistic poet's introspective songwriting and distinctive folk sound. However, many and arguably more music fans prefer Jeff Buckley's heart-wrenching interpretation in 1994 that truly plucked on our heartstrings. Buckley's ethereal vocals embraced the depths of human emotion, infusing Hallelujah with an otherworldly, dare I say, heavenly force. This beautiful man's delicate guitar picking added an intimate touch, creating a haunting atmosphere that continues to resonate with listeners on a profound level. While Cohen's version captivated with its lyrical depth, Buckley's cover brought a heightened sense of emotional vulnerability, catapulting Hallelujah into another realm of musical immortality. It goes like this, the fourth, the fifth, the minor fall and the major lift. You know that ethereal 60s sunny love letter to California that gets used weirdly often in commercials, even though it seems kind of diminishing? That's California Dreamin' by the Mamas and the Papas. Or is it? California Dreamin' was written by the soprano of the group Michelle Phillips and her then-husband John a couple years before forming the Mamas and the Papas. They soon landed a record deal thanks to the recommendation of Barry Maguire and in turn allowed him to record California Dreamin' with the Mamas and the Papas serving as backup vocalists where the purity of their voices clashes and unfortunately overshadows the more classic rock and roll stylings of Maguire. His version isn't necessarily bad, though I don't particularly care for it. There's just a disparity between the main and backup vocals that is impossible to ignore and just makes me want to run back to that more familiar version. The Mamas and the Papas take has this beautifully bewitching quality to it, like a love spell. So it's technically a cover of a song that was originally written by the band covering it? Music is complicated sometimes. If I was in Get ready to roll down the river of rhythm with Proud Mary. 
Creedence Clearwater Revival set the waters in motion with their original version in 1969, characterized by its gritty blues rock sound and swampy guitar riffs. But it was Tina Turner who unleashed a tidal wave of energy with her cover in 1971. Turner's electrifying vocals and irresistible stage presence turned Proud Mary into a soulful storm of rock and roll might. Her adaptation enveloped the song with an infectious groove and a dynamic brass section that added a whole new dimension to the track. It became a show-stopping centerpiece of her live performances and earned its place as one of Turner's signature songs, surpassing the commercial success of the original and propelling her career to new heights. The Tide is High by the Paragons was a reggae gem from 1967, capturing the laid-back charm of the Jamaican music scene. With classic, velvety vocals that are smooth as butter, the original is something that more people should have in rotation. But it was Blondie's buoyant cover in 1980 that breathed new life into the song. This time, it was Debbie Harry's enchanting, siren-like approach that lured listeners into sun-soaked dreams. With more of a pop sound, the group transformed the tide as high into an irresistible anthem. Their version included vibrant synthesizers and a bouncy bass line, propelling it to number one on the Billboard charts. I'm sure we're all familiar with 80s synth-pop giants Tears for Fears, known for their sparklingly bright and slightly funky electronic sound, serving as a defining example of the best of the era's music. What you might not be familiar with is the fact that the slow song from Donnie Darko and countless memes by Gary Jules and Michael Andrews was originally performed by Tears for Fears in a much, much different way. I think the best way to sum up the differences between versions here is just to look at the delivery of that famous opening line. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places. The Tears for Fears version opens with clanging, tinkering percussion, nearly blending with the vocals, and the line is sung pretty quickly, moving us into the monotony of the described world. When Gary Jules sings that line, it feels like it takes everything out of him just to begin to speak about how drab and unlivable life can be sometimes. As someone who adores the theater of masking a sad song in shiny pop packaging, even I have to agree with Tears for Fears that Jules and Andrew's version is the ultimate form of the song, and goes back to our original thesis of how much a song can take on a new life when in the hands of someone else with a different lived experience. All around me are familiar faces, worn out places. Worn out Thank you for all of the support on this series, and while Bryn and I plan on working on other ideas for the foreseeable future, we might continue to beat this dead horse into the ground if everybody asks us nicely. Have a good day. Thank you for watching that video. If you want to support the channel, feel free to like, comment, and subscribe. You can follow me on social media at RenshawHS. You can support me on Patreon or Twitch. And thank you again. I'll see you soon.